Hi, I'm Fel the Blythe, and I've finally done it, folks. Finally here, after about a month and a half of just research, I'm finally here to present the Hellenistic Deep Dive video. For those of you who might be new, first of all, welcome to my channel, I'm Phil the Blythe. I'm a Hellenic polytheist, and let me get you caught up to speed as to why the Hellenistic age might be significant. Classical antiquity, colloquially called ancient Greece, was actually split up into several different eras. This can be useful when surveying and reconstructing one of these religions as one age may look and actually probably does, look starkly different than the next age. And the ages are as follows. The Greek Dark Ages, around 1200 to 800 BCE. This is following the end of the Minoan civilization, or more accurately, the Mycenaean civilization. The Archaic Age, 800 to 480 BCE. This includes Homer and Hesiod, and much of the building blocks for the next era, which probably know the classical age, 480 BCE to 323 BCE, the shortest yet most culturally long lived of the ancient Greek eras, contains most of our knowledge and influences of the ancient Greeks, starting with the Persian invasion of Greece and ending with the death of Alexander the Great. And then the Hellenistic age, 323 to 30 BCE, and that's this video, <laughs> and longtime viewers should be able to say it with me now. The Hellenistic Age is from the death, death of Alexander, Alexander the Great to the rise of the Roman Empire. Empire. And everything after this point is no longer classical antiquity, but considered late antiquity. Generally, Hellenic polytheism as a modern religion focuses on the classical age, dipping its toes into the archaic age as well as the Hellenistic where gaps arrive. Each age built upon the one that preceded it. The Hellenistic Age is such a stark departure from the classical age that it's really its own entire thing. The Archaic Age, while different than the Classical Age, is still like fairly similar to it, but the Classical Age versus the Hellenistic Age I like apples and oranges. And this video is a hope to scratch that proverbial iceberg. This video is probably going to be pretty beefy because the Hellenistic Age spans about 300 years and like 87 different kingdoms from the Celtic Gauls of the Danube River Basin to what is now modern day Siberia. The Hellenistic Age was an age almost similar to our own in certain regards. It was heavily globalized, cultural mixing left and right, and yes, quite a bit unstable. Before I launch into the religion part, we need to set some groundwork. So without further ado, I'm going to walk you from the classical age of Athens to the beginning of the Hellenistic age in 60 seconds or less. Wish me luck. Athena Minerva, preserve me. Okay, I'm gonna set a timer. Oh, shit, it started. Okay, so the Peloponnesian War, which was between Athens and Sparta, right? I mean, there's other cities say Sparta, but like, I don't have time to get into all that. Between Athens and Sparta. Who wins? Well, unfortunately, uh, well, uh, who wins? Well, it is, in fact, Sparta who wins, and they install a, what they becomes known as the 30 Tyrants in Athens. However, the 30 Tyrants are actually not very long-lived and are quickly overthrown. There is actually... Uh, and then there are other random infightings between the war. And then comes along a guy named Philip II. Philip II was of Macedonia, which was at that time probably the strongest region of Greece. He uh, colonizes all of it except for Sparta. And then Alexander the Great is born. He colonizes all of Greece, including Sparta. And then all over from here to here to here to here. And then uh, he has a child and dies. Now we are in the Hellenistic Age. And I have... Yes! I did it! I did it! Okay, well, obviously there are major gaps in there, but that's just kind of the, the basics of, of that. What happened after the death of Alexander the Great was a sh** show. The entire empire fractured and kings rose and fell, and even though he technically had an heir, well, let's just say no one really cared. <laughs> All of what was once united, cultures that had remained largely untouched for years were suddenly thrown into complete chaos. You see, people have said that Alexander the Great was a conqueror, but he wasn't a ruler. 
And so we get thrown into a world in which deities and mythology from these vastly different cultures collide. And what will change will never again be the same. Of course, this wouldn't be a fail video if I wasn't putting in a bunch of caveats. When I speak about the Hellenistic era religion, it's, it's really religions. And I'm going to be saying religions plural because there is no one Hellenistic religion. Hellenistic Hellenism is its own thing. Hellenistic Kemeticism is its own thing. Hellenistic Hinduism, Hellenistic Buddhism, Hellenistic Judaism, which is actually where the word Hellenistic comes from. While all these religions had interactions with each other and were defined by their Hellenisticness, they were not a unified religion. Religions are internally diverse. And when it comes to the Hellenistic age, they are certainly externally diverse as well. The designation of the Hellenistic age is also rather arbitrary because here's the deal. Historians divide things into ages and give things titles, not because it's actually like the most accurate thing to do, but because it is, it is the simplest way <laughs> to survey a, a certain age. The biggest pet peeve among a lot of historians when people say the Renaissance, you have to be specific, the Italian Renaissance, the Flemish Renaissance, the French Renaissance. They are very different renaissances, but they are all under the header of renaissance because otherwise everyone would just be kind of driving themselves mad if they were just analyzing this one specific person in this one specific house in this one specific town in this one specific year. So we make things easier by putting them in a little container. The Hellenistic age, as any age is, and especially, is an age of an exception to the rule, which is why my conclusions are going to be kind of vague. The Hellenistic Age was made up of several separate kingdoms that took place thousands of miles apart. So what I am studying here is not each individual kingdom. Each individual one could probably be its own video or series of videos. But I'm rather trying to do a survey of the age as a whole and what separated it from the age that came before it. If I skipped over something, likelihood is that I saw what it was or I read about it and I just elected not to include it to avoid further complicating this already beefy video. When studying religions, it helps tremendously to map their similarities and differences in a way that doesn't make your essay, video, etc. look like a conspiracy theory board. That being said, I'm not going to actually focus entirely on Greece for this video. As in many cases specifically, Athens was an exception to many of those things that were going on religiously. In his book, Athens in the Hellenistic Age by John D. Michelson, he notes that while Athens was ultimately an exception to a lot of the changes that were going on in the Hellenistic Age, it does not mean that they were not at various points influenced by it. And the last caveat, I am not gonna be getting into the PGM in this video. That's a whole other can of worms that I don't really feel like opening and it would likely be its own video. And my main concern with this is the popular religion and the PGM, the Greek magical papyri, something that was done by magicians. And while it later would influence popular religion, and I am gonna touch on it, it is not my main concern for this video. And if I added it, it would be like, it, I would add 30 more minutes to this video and I really don't wanna do that. Okay, caveats aside, let's dive into what makes the Hellenistic age religions Hellenistic and what makes them so special. These elements that I will cover are the rise of the personal religion, ruler gods and the deification of people, the advent of monotheism. I know this one's gonna get spicy. Extra spicy. Mystery cults and of course syncretism. The rise of the personal religion, also personal religion versus civic religion. But while the Hellenistic age was not as extreme in its religious diversity as ours is today, it still had a significant amount of individualization to it. After chaos in the wake of the fracturing of Alexander's empire, the whole of the Mediterranean, Mesopotamian, and beyond were thrown into complete pandemonium. Rulers were constantly changing hands. States were rising and then falling. Religious temples were founded and then disbanded. Many scholars have called the Hellenistic age an age of anxiety and despair. Skepticism and superstition are two sides of this polarization that began to happen in the Hellenistic age with some people going very, very superstitious as we can see with certain mystery cults and as well as the Greek magical papyri. Other people went full skeptic, which we see the advent of early atheistic philosophy. And remember, as I said, this is where the PGM comes from in which magicians are not above 
finding a god when such a thing would be seen as quite heretical in the classical age. People greatly desired closer and more personal connections to deities. While the state was falling apart, the family unit didn't have to be. Gods became so personalized that people would attach their own names to them, hoping that by appeasing Zeus Philippios, Philippios hoped that Zeus was less likely to bring him harm since, since they were now connected in this way. This is why we see many of the big name so-called Olympians sort of wane in popularity and be supplanted by gods like Dionysos, Tyche, and hero gods, gods that were closer to the people. Additionally, entities with chthonic aspects like the two goddesses, Persephone and Demeter, Isis and Serapis and Hecate began to rise in cult popularity. Here's what Luther H. Martin had to say in his 1987 book, Hellenistic Religions. Traditional Olympian religion associated was with the polis belonged to the established socio-political order. One was born in a particular locale and into its particular religion. Chthonic religion, however, was a response to the spontaneity of the sacred, a voluntary association of individuals that embodied an implicit challenge to the official socio-political order, whereas the fundamental characteristics of the Olympians was their transcendence, that is, their superiority and control over human affairs. A more direct relationship was possible between Chthonic deities and their human suppliants. I also want to share a quote, a quote for you to think about from the Cambridge Companion to the Hellenistic Age in an essay written by John D. Michelson. For the first time, Greeks were making personal choices about which deities to worship, and as a result, the deities they chose to worship may have been more personal to them. The expatriate Greeks were turning more to the deities who could offer them and their families personally, rather than the state as a whole, health, safety, and the good life. Deifying people. While not as prolific a ruler cult as would be seen in ancient Rome, the kingdoms at Hellenistic age were not unfamiliar with the practice. In fact, it started with Alexander the Great, who instituted a hero cult to himself, or a ruler god cult to himself in much of the areas that he colonized, and it soon became expected of Hellenistic era rulers. Most of the Hellenistic Age rulers were at one point deified and received a state cult and state worship. Even those that once refused it, like the Seleucids of Central Asia, they eventually ended up receiving it anyway, because people saw that if they gave them the kind of worship that they would give to, traditionally to gods, that they would get the same things, and very readily and reliably so. Say, if they were to appease the king with offerings and libations, the king, who was very immediately tangible, might genuinely help them out financially. People saw the rulers as gods in flesh. It was said that when Demetrius the Liberator arrived in Athens, that someone said, the other gods are away. You we see face to face. Pretty blasphemous take coming straight out of Athens where the religion had changed the least. Additionally, these rulers sometimes claimed to be descended from gods or even being the gods incarnate. Many times they'd specifically name gods of two different pantheons in hopes of achieving credence with their foreign denizens, as well as fostering cohabitations amongst the native population and the non-native Greeks who were arriving. After his wife's death, Ptolemy II made, made her, Arsinoe, a deity. Not a hero, a deity, with her own cult and priestess. Ptolemy and Arsinoe were even considered deities within their own lifetime, pulling from the traditional Egyptian idea of the pharaoh as a god incarnate. Ptolemy III and his wife Berenike called themselves the Theoi Eurygetai, the benefactor gods, and associated themselves with the cults and myths of Isis, Serapis, Aphrodite, and Dionysus. Ptolemy XII went so far as to claim he was the new Dionysus. These ruler gods even got their own festivals and scheduled sacrifices alongside long-standing immortal gods like Zeus and Athena. However, despite this, they never quite surpassed them or became truly divine. They had sanctuaries, altars, priests, festivals, rituals, even myths, but they were still ultimately mortal. Their cults were disestablished and they never received devotionalism from the rot and the weary. It wasn't just rulers who were deified though. If you saw my hero worship video from a month or so back, then you might've heard me mention that everyone was heroizing everybody in the Hellenistic age. Heroes were once larger than life figures, but by the Hellenistic age, heroes could be people that you actually knew. Famous writers and athletes were all at certain times given praxis. As John D. Michelson says in the Cambridge Companion to the Hellenistic age, chapter 10, in a sense, the ordinary dead man was as much a real hero to his family as the Hellenistic king was a real god to his subject. 
By the late Hellenistic period, however, we find that individuals were being, and no doubt wanting to be, widely honored by name, with statues and inscriptions for their service as priests, priestesses. Fathers and mothers honored their daughters, children honored their parents. Philosophical monotheism. When studying the Hellenistic irreligions, there was a very common idea that all of these various things deifying people, personalizing the gods, a, a search for a better afterlife, as we'll get into when we talk about mystery cults, uh, as well as blending with many world religions at the time, would become Christianity, and that there was sort of no other way for this to go. Well, there is some truth there. A lot of philosophical developments and cultural meldings created a breeding ground for what become Christianity. To say it is a direct combination of the clashing of religions and that this was kind of bound to happen is a bit of an oversimplification of the facts. However, one of the theories that would lay the groundwork and later influence later Christian writers but struggle to make it into actual praxis was philosophical monotheism. Yes, there were pagans who were monotheists. Pagan monotheism is a thing. When many Hellenic polytheists begin to read later, later, later writings, such as the Middle, Middle Platonists, Plutarch, Stoics, many are surprised to find the occasional mention of God the singular. No, it is not a strange Victorian translation for once. Many of these writers are in fact writing Theos. They are referring to a God in a singular form a singular source, which they give many names. Sometimes this god is named as Zeus. Others, like the Stoics, refer to this source as Logos or Hegemonicon. Here's a quote from Pagan Monotheism and Pagan Cult by Frederick Brank. In Plutarch's On the E at Adelphi, the last and most impressive speaker, his teacher Ammonius, equates God with being, Tuan, and describes him as living in instant eternity ruling and conserving the world with his providence. The setting is a religious shrine. Delphi and a religious question is posed. The meaning of the E erected there. For Ammonius, the traditional Apollo is only a fate image of the real god. Even if Ammonius is not very explicit, the worshippers are to direct their cult at least indirectly to the real god, described in Middle Platonic terms. There is a lot about Plutarch and philosophical monotheism that is not actually in the realm of this video, and I don't really usually like to cover the nitty gritty of philosophy for the most part, as philosophy was closed to anyone who wasn't an elite male, with exceptions. And so cross-pollination with the general populace was slim and tended not to happen until much later when their writings were rediscovered and given new life. Philosophical monotheism found in Hellenistic Age is not really all that similar to the modern Christian monotheism. Pagan monotheism is better described as panentheism, meaning that there is one divine source and each of the gods we see are emanations of this source. This is also a concept found in Hinduism. This is also like the basis of soft polytheism. You're not really necessarily saying, as in the case of Ammonius, that Apollo does not exist, but rather Apollo is a reflection of the divine source. Philosophical monotheism also did not really see praxis, and thus would not come to influence common religion until much later. But when it did, ooh boy. The main reason I'm even bringing it up is because it's going to feature heavily in my Hecate part two video. But as the Hellenistic era went on, and this ties into my next section, certain mystery cults became nearly henotheistic in their worship. Henotheism means that they worship one deity while recognizing the existence of others. Here's a quote again from John D. Michelson. We find in the late Hellenistic period that their devotees as missionaries and often at the gods' requests now founded new sanctuaries, promoted their gods by descriptions of their miracles and powers, and actively proselytized. These deities were credited by their devotees with an increasing range of powers, with Isis in particular claiming the competencies of virtually all Greek gods and even authority over fate in the underworld. As such, she could fulfill all the religious needs of her devotees, and the concept of monotheism is established in practice, not just in literature or philosophical theology. Wow, so <laughs> I'm actually going to unpack that specific quote in the next section, which here we are. I'm going to point it out here when I talk about mystery cults that I don't make a habit about talking about the details of mystery cults, as I don't really think that information is mine to share. Just because it is known now does not mean it is mine to share. So I will not ever be getting into the specifics about actual practices of mystery cults. 
And while on the surface there might appear to be stark differences between mystery cults, the fact of their existence and why they exist in the first place is what makes them similar, which is what I'm going to be examining. What is a mystery cult? A mystery cult is an initiatory tradition that is sworn to secrecy. That is where the practical similarities begin and end. However, the cause of their existence, as I mentioned, are similar in many ways. As the state religion shifted and changed, people felt that the state religion was no longer offering them what they needed. And in many cases, what they needed in their chaotic lives was an assurance of a peaceful afterlife. Certain mystery cults were so popular that the state actually tried to outlaw their existence. That, um, didn't go well. As I mentioned earlier, Catholic entities are sort of supplanting Uranic ones in popularity. And many, if not most, mystery cults surrounded Catholic aspects of deities. And looking at that quote from John D. Michelson, they were honoring these gods in all aspects of their life, not just one. And in many cases, they controlled fate. And another strange thing began to happen with these mystery cults. They began proselytizing. This is something that is previously unheard of in the ancient Greek religion. For the most part, it was like you honored these gods because that's kind of what your parents did and, and that's where you lived and so that's where you honored. And oftentimes when Greeks went to Egypt, they would offer to the Egyptian gods because they were in Egypt. But the Hellenistic age, this all breaks down and we see for the first time missionaries <laughs> coming from these mystery cults in order to draw in followers and worshipers of certain deities. And many times for the Greek expatriates, they began to take their gods with them to these new lands and the people of these new lands adopted them. And so they created what we're gonna get into next, syncretic gods and sometimes new deities in their entirety. Researching for this video was quite overwhelming. And honestly, each of these new or syncretized deities could get their own deity deep dive video. Perhaps they might. If there are, if you're particularly drawn to anyone on this short and inexhaustive list that I will be covering, please let me know and I will look into it and consider doing a full video on them. The Megaloi Theorei and the Kevaroi, the great gods of the island of Samothrak. The exact identities of these great gods have been elusive for many centuries because it was considered taboo to even speak their names. Now, I struggled to find a conclusion on if the Megaloi Theoi and the Kevaroi are the same entities, or the Kevaroi were part of the Megaloi Theoi or presided over their mysteries, but the Kevaroi were twin gods who presided over the mysteries of Samothraki and specifically relate to the mysteries of the goddesses Demeter, Persephone, and Hecate. The Kebaroi were the sons of Hephaestus and were thusly tied to metalwork. When talking about the Megaloi Theoi, the Great Mother was another figure found in the numbers of the great gods. Although her actual name still eludes us today, perhaps she's Kybele, perhaps she's Demeter, every group who the cult of the great gods touched associated her with a different figure. There's a bunch of other ones too, like Aphrodite Zorinthia, who may or may not be Hecate, and Cadmilos, a fertility god who later got synced with Hermes, and Axiokrosos and Axiokursa, who became syncretized with Hades and Persephone. Moving out of Samothraki, let's head to Egypt. Serapis and Isis. I'm gonna cover Isis first, as she's an example of a former god getting a Hellenistic revamp. Isis is a goddess of death and rebirth, as tied to the myth of her brother-husband Osiris. From what I spoke of earlier, you can probably already guess why her cult spread rapidly between the Mediterranean world and the Fertile Crescent. Isis became connected to basically every Greek goddess. There was a massive cult of Isis Aphrodite, in which she was worshipped for her connection to sexuality and gained an aspect of seafaring. She was also syncretized with Tyche and Fortuna, who I will cover next, in her aspect to control the fate of a city. She was also syncretized with Demeter, especially in her Chthonic aspects, and her search for Persephone as Isis searched for Osiris in the underworld. The list goes on. Isis was popular enough to become a fully-fledged cult worship on mainland Greece in Athens. She even features in several epics written around this time. She was further tied to the Greek world through the creation of Serapis. Serapis is a prime example of a fully Hellenistic deity. He is neither Greek nor an Egyptian, but rather Greco-Egyptian. What's fascinating about Serapis is that he is a god that was mostly constructed, usually Constructed deities form out of kings or hero gods, and not just because a bunch of people sat down on a council and were like, hey, we need to find something to unite our people. Oh, I have an idea. 
this guy. I could get into the origins of Serapis. It's kind of wild. It's it's not at like it's not just simple that he was just entirely constructed. Like there is evidence for his existence prior, but he was like really not a guy until the Hellenistic Age and Ptolem one of the Ptolemies. I don't I don't. I can't keep tracking them. One of the Ptolemies was like, yo, this is a good idea. Let's make this guy huge. Serapis was also syncretized with Hades or Pluto and was called King of the Underworld. Serapis replaced Osiris as Isis's husband and together their mystery cult changed religion forever. However, funnily enough, Isis remained the most popular one and her legacy far outlasts that of Serapis. Tyche and deified daemons, where once the Theoi and the Morii were the commanders of fate, with the rapid rise of Alexander the Great and the just as rapid fall of the countries who had lasted for millennia, Tyche rose quickly from mere daemon to Thea. She now commanded the fate of every city and every person within it. She was appeased to, and whoever supplicated her would have a positive fate. In fact, in the Roman period, each city had their own Tyche and that was unique to them. And it's wild to me to think of a daemon, which is a personification of a thing, like Tyche, would become a fully fledged goddess. I'm gonna do a video about daemons because it's hard to explain why they're they're not exactly the gods. They're like personifications of things itself. They're more an animistic, I guess. Except they 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 don't just like embody like things. They also embody emotions. Many other daemons were actually elevated to full godhood, a full apotheosis. We have Orete, which is virtue, irony, which is peace and Nike, which is victory, all became goddesses in their own right. So what does this mean for modern worshippers? I'm gonna be honest, I did not expect to really love the Hellenistic Age in the way that I did. In fact, I'm continuing to study and read even after I completed the research for this video. I recently bought two books from eBay sellers, one containing mostly primary sources from this era, and the other I deep dive into the ideas of piety, mystery, and gnosis, which are central in understanding the Hellenistic era religions. And I have a Greek magical papyri on the way. There's just something so personalized and strangely relatable about the Hellenistic age. And recently I've actually been branching out into more syncretic aspects of my practice, like adding Tyche into my retinue, honoring aspects of Athena Minerva, which some of you may have noticed. <laughs> the Hellenistic age was about tailoring your religion to fit your needs in an ever-changing chaotic world. If that's not the 20 teens or the 2020 so far, then I don't know what is. I think what's so awesome about Hellenic polytheism is that we are modern people looking back. So we can pull from the Archaic Age, we can pull from the Greek Dark Ages. I know people who pull from the Minoan Age, although that can get complicated fast. We can dip our toes in the Hellenistic Age and we can look at all of these influences that just practically exploded out of this part of the world. And we can take that and adapt that for our own personal practices. For many of us who are pagans or polytheists, there is no state religion for us, which is how many of these religions were traditionally practiced. So it can be really awesome to see how the ancient people adapted and tailored and personalized their own religions at home and for their own family. As many of us exist as individuals or in very small communities. So I highly recommend continuing to examine the Hellenistic age if you are a solo practitioner like most of us are and take from it what resonates with you. And with that, I'm gonna leave you for now and look for my Hecate part two, finally, which this is gonna lay the groundwork for. Thank you so much and I'll see you in the next one. But first I gotta show you my cat. Look at that, I got him a sweater. All right, <laughs> bye for real.